Hello, and welcome to episode 9 of Inherited Will, a One Piece podcast. A weekly podcast discussing each week's manga chapter, news, and a reread of past chapters. My name is Thomas. And I'm Jordan. No big announcements on our end this week. Uh, We'll be jumping right into it, covering manga chapter 1006 and rereading manga chapters 90 through 100. But before that... I do actually want to talk in brief about a little bit in this week's anime episode, if that's cool with you. Yeah, I decided to dive right in and watch the anime, even though I haven't for a few weeks. It makes me kind of want to go back and watch some of the older ones. But what do you want to talk about? So, in this episode, we see Orochi's first meeting with the old lady with the clone fruit. I don't remember her name. She's one of the Kurozumi, the old lady. Remember that one? Yep. Now, I didn't notice anything weird about this when I was reading this in the manga. But watching the anime episode, where it's like all on the big screen and in color and all that, during the bit where she's showing off her power to Orochi, there was a face in there, one of the two like mystery faces that weren't hers or Orochi's, that I recognized. Do you pick up on that by any chance? I saw the faces, but they flashed by so quickly that I did not register who they were. Well, what if I were to tell you that one of those faces was Shiki the Golden Lion? Really? I'm about 99% sure that that is the case. Didn't he have, like, facial hair? Like, a goatee or mutton chops or something? Well, yes, but you gotta remember this was many years ago that this flashback is taking place that's true okay i'm gonna go ahead and send some comparison images to you on discord right quick i see it i hear you that is totally the same guy right (laughs) yeah that is pretty undeniable so you gotta consider the implications of this right at some point this woman must have touched shiki's face in order to be able to clone him Now, granted, throughout this episode, she's not really abiding by the same rules that Mr. Two seemed to have to, right? He used to have to touch his face with one hand to transform and then touch his face with the other one to transform back. She doesn't do that at all. So we don't really know for sure if she actually has to touch someone in the face in order to be able to clone them. But at the very least, she, like, saw the guy, right? (laughs) Right. She knew him. Well, maybe not know, but yes, saw him. Right. We don't know that for sure, but it does seem to indicate some sort of connection. So maybe this woman has some sort of connection with the Rocks Pirates as a whole, right? She very well could, yeah. Which got my brain a clunking along. So, you know, Odin leaves to go with the Whitebeard and the boys. And then when he gets back, Kaido's just kind of there. We don't really get any sort of explanation for why or how he showed up, right? Yeah. What if this woman's connection to the Rocks Pirates, and therefore Kaido, is the reason that he's there? Maybe the old lady reached out to him in some capacity and said, Hey, this is like a really good opportunity. It would be pretty cool of you to come down here and conquer this place for us. And like, here's what you get out of it. You know, some sort of deal was struck. Yeah, that would be big. I think this is probably the kind of thing that Oda will address one day in an SBS But I think we're on to something there. Something suspicious. Yeah, I'm sure you will get your moment to gloat a little bit when it happens. And until then, I choose not to think about it. (laughs) Very good. On the note of me being able to gloat about it, God, I hope so. But that's all I had to say about the anime. Anything in particular of note that you wanted to point out? One thing that I did want to point out, it felt so much more in-depth with the Roger and Whitebeard confrontation. Like, I went back to the manga chapters just to see kind of where it landed and if they had done a good, you know, a good job. And there's basically like one panel between Odin getting blasted away and Whitebeard appearing fighting Roger, like their weapons already basically touching. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the anime, he flies through like six trees and then you see Whitebeard jumping over things and flying in. So it just looked so much better to have the in-between moments to fill in any questionable blanks. I agree. Uh, in Wano in particular, Toei has been not adding, I don't know if I would consider it filler, but that's kind of what it is. But just kind of fleshing out the canon moments a little bit more. 
like the Hawkins versus Law confrontation that was early in the arc. Okay. And uh, as long as they're not like taking too many liberties, I'm cool with it. Yeah. It makes for great moments like what we saw in this particular episode. Right. It's just filling in some blanks, which are to be assumed, but it makes sense for that not to be in the manga because you want to hit those other key points. Agreed. But I think we've talked about the anime long enough. Let's go ahead and jump into the manga discussion. Chapter 1006, starting out with a big old color spread of the Beast Pirates executives. Yeah, it's so colorful. Like page one and ulti especially. I don't know if I've ever seen them colored before, but it's, it's a good look. I think the only other time we've seen them colored was when one of the more recent manga volumes has the, most of these guys on the cover. But aside from that, if you haven't been following the volume releases, this will be the first time a general manga reader would see these guys in color. Yeah, and what a grand entrance it is. I'm not sure why, and I did see that volume cover when it came out, but I really wasn't expecting Black Maria's hair to be blonde. That one is kind of jarring, but like that is a typical quote-unquote beauty standard thing. True. Maybe not so much overall, but like, I don't know, that's a trope. That's why everyone likes Jack so much. <laughs> because he's blonde, that's why. <laughs> yep, Jack and Queen. I am pretty sure that's true. And we don't know what color Caden's hair is, but I assume that that fire behind his head is just his hair, which is almost blonde. <laughs> sure, yeah, that counts. More, I guess more a, of a better ginger. argument would be made. Yeah, I was about to say, it's more of a redhead type deal, but close enough for me. Mm-hmm. All right, jumping into the chapter proper. On the first page here, we are on the performance floor Skull Dome, something that I'm going to whine about (laughs) in a little bit when it becomes more relevant. Oh, boy. But uh, one of those people with the face mask spots Momonosuke and the gang fleeing from the storage room. Uh, Well, she doesn't spot Momonosuke, but she does spot the gang, and he is there, so I'll give you that. Well, on the next page... Somebody's got, like, the lock-on X-ray vision on Momonosuke and Sadi Yamato's little thing. It's not explained, so it doesn't make much sense to me. I wasn't sure if that was just Oda kind of showing, like, this is where he is. Because to see through a layer of clothes and then just see a silhouette of a human is a very specific kind of power. Indeed. So unless they can dial it in or something, it feels a little weird. Now that you mention it, it might just be Oda doing it for our benefit, because that's like one of his quote-unquote Oda boxes there with the name and everything, the same style that he's been using throughout all of Wano. So I think you might be onto something there. Yeah, I think it's specifically for people like us that were like, well, where exactly (laughs) is Momo going to go? Is he on the leg? Yeah. Indeed. He got us good once again. But Momo is in there having a good time. Uh... (laughs) Not sure if that's a face of joy or shock or what's going on with that kid. He doesn't uh, know what to think anymore, I'm sure. (laughs) Mixed feelings, considering this person considers herself to be his father. Oh, yeah, no doubt. (laughs) But they are fleeing the scene. Shinobu is like, hey, uh, it's cool that we're fleeing and such, but can we do it a little bit less conspicuously? That would be pretty dope. I'm a ninja. Yeah, that would be nice for her. One thing that I considered here is that like we don't really know how strong Yamato is yet right true Kaido's crew does know how strong she is so anyone who gets sent in response to her has to at least match her power level if not surpass it you would think so so like as soon as we see who she's up against I think we'll get a good indicator of where she's at I suppose so but like I'm just making this assumption, but it seems to me that they're fleeing and she's just going to end up fighting whoever they happen to bump into along the way. Because like I think I said last episode, pretty much everyone's kind of indisposed at the moment, you know? Yeah, but there's a big broadcast and the uh, the Beast Pirates may end up prioritizing taking out Momo first, you know? like That's true. There's a reason that it's being broadcast to everyone. Like, Sanji hears it, so it is going everywhere. If these surveillance people have been instructed to, like, broadcast Momo's whereabouts and, like, seek him out, then I guess it's a pretty high priority for Kaido or whoever gave the directive to find Momonosuke, so. Right, yeah. But that takes us into the next little sequence here. Sanji hears this broadcast, 
So that's how he finds out that they're going after Momonosuke and Shinobu. Doesn't know who Yon Master Yamato is, but that kind of puts him in a bit of a pickle where he doesn't know who needs him more, Kinemon and the boys or Momonosuke. He does make a decision, though, but we don't get to know what it is. Yeah, do you have any thoughts there? Well, I've got a couple of thoughts about this, as a matter of fact. So, from Sanji's perspective, Kinemon and the gang are, like, imminently dying, I believe, according to the broadcast he heard when he was captured by Black Maria, right? Mm-hmm. Momonosuke, similarly, imminently being pursued... And as far as he's concerned, is only being protected by Shinobu, right? He doesn't know who Yamato is to gauge a power level on this person. So he certainly can't assume that she's going to be able to protect him. Right. But he also knows that uh, Kinemon has someone, he doesn't know who it is, but a 10th person in that room with him trying to nurse them back to health or whatever. So I think from Sani's perspective, he would know that Kinemon would rather him go after Momonosuke. So I think that's probably going to be the decision that's been made. Yeah, strategically, it just makes sense. Like, you do need to save the next head of house. Like, you, right. that's your top priority, for sure. Precisely. But then I started thinking about, okay, so if he does go after Yamato, where is he going to go, right? Where does that take him in the fight? So I was looking at what it says on the first page where the lady, the lady with the mask is like peeking out over, looking at Yamato and the gang. And it says, performance floor skull dome. And looking at that panel, and that looks like like the main room that earlier Marco, uh, Queen, King, the Ice Demons and all them were having their conflict in. You can even see like the tower over there that Zoro sliced up during that confrontation, right? Yeah, yeah. So if that's where Yamato is, why don't we see her at all, or any of these people, later in the confrontation when Marco and them appear to still be there? That is weird. I'd like to see a map of the whole place laid out all at once to get a better grasp on this, because right now I can't really piece it together in my head, but I see what you're saying. And then later in the chapter, when we actually like cut to that bit with like, Hiogoro, Drake, and all those boys that are in that room that we know they're in, it's labeled as performance floor inside the dome. Is that different? Why didn't they just use the same label if it was going to be the same place? Good point. Point is, I'm a little bit confused about the layout of this place. Yeah? <laughs> like you said, I wish we had a map. Right. It'd be very nice. I understand it's like floating in the sky or whatever, but I think we can get it to happen. <laughs> Indeed. But yeah, Sanji seems to have made a decision. And he's running off. We'll probably catch up with that guy. Maybe next chapter. Certainly in a few. I'm looking forward to whichever direction he ends up going. Quite so. On the following page, we pop to the entrance of Onigashima outside the big old skull mouth, catching up with the conflict between Perispero, Wanda, and Carrot, where unfortunately it does seem as though they got their asses beat by Perispero, presumably because it got cloudy. Yeah, it's a real shame that they couldn't coordinate with Nami to just kind of clear those clouds away, because this was kind of an integral part of the plan. Certainly for Carrot's operation. (laughs) Yeah, it just, you know, having someone that can control the weather seems like it would have been helpful here, but I guess she was just too busy elsewhere. I suppose. Just rough luck on their part. Yeah, but the flash of Pedro kind of makes me think that, like, this isn't over yet. They're going to get another chance to uh, get their revenge. Maybe. I mean, they seem pretty badly beaten, and Perispero doesn't kill them, but he seems confident enough that they're going to stay down to just walk away, leaving them alive. But then why the flashback to Pedro at all? Just to remind us who he is, you know. That was a whole arc ago. Might have forgotten who that guy is by now. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure. (laughs) Once a guy blows himself up, he also blows himself out of your memory. I'm pretty sure is how it works. That's how it usually works for me, yeah. Indeed. But yeah, maybe. Maybe they might get back up and rush back in, but, but why? Why not just have this conflict resolve itself in full out here? What would be the narrative purpose to having them beaten down here and return to fight the same battle later. Mm. I said weaker and indoors, I assume. I guess that's 
fair unless it was all of them kind of grouping together to get revenge for the whole tribe type deal but even that feels a little odd oh the rest of the mates you mean yes yes that could be I really don't know if there are any more mates standing, though. Last time we saw any of them, like I said, they were on the roof. But yeah. <laughs> after Jack left, I don't think we've even seen a body. Yeah. We've got Chopper on our side. He'll come up with something, I'm sure. No doubt. That guy's basically a mate anyway. Yeah. Barris Barra, though, he's talking some shit. And he just says, all right, see you later. Go chew on some grass. And he heads back inside to show these children what the Emperors of the Sea are really about. Good old cocky Parasparo. Apparently he has every right to be. He's been shown to be quite powerful over and over again. Yeah, I mean, he's not officially one of the three sweet commanders, but I would guess he's roughly on their level of power. He is Bid's mom's firstborn, after all. Kind of seems like he's a commander in everything but in name. Yeah, I'd be scared of him. Yeah, he's like the de facto captain, pretty mm-hmm. much. Mm-hmm. Now that Cut Curry's off doing... Something. I would assume that if he were here on a Wano, we would have seen him by now, at least in passing. But speaking of the Big Mom Pirates, I was thinking earlier today that there's like pretty much no chance they're actually going to make it into this confrontation now, huh? Now that the island is like flying. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much completely cut off from anyone else joining. Poor Smoothie. <laughs> oh, darn, yeah. Introduced oh, no. so early on in the whole cake island arc and is the only one of the three sweet commanders to not do anything <laughs> yeah i don't know what to tell you she drew the short straw yeah she chased after the straw hats in a boat yep for a while and got real big for some reason but didn't fight anybody just chased showed up here got knocked off a boat twice oh boy it's yeah. rough being a not Katakuri or Pero Sparrow on the Big Mom Pirates, I guess. <laughs> the only two that matter. <laughs> sure, yeah. That takes us on to the following page. Uh, we're back inside that pesky dome on the performance floor where uh, the samurai corps are having a rough time with this whole Oni virus business. It's not being kind to anyone. Our boys are taking hits left and right, but Chopper's going through it. He's going to find a way. I mean, I guess so, but seems to be perhaps not struggling in the image down there, but certainly a bit of a time crunch here, Chopper, so I'm going to need you to pick up the pace a little bit. People are dying, like, imminently. He's only a raccoon dog. What do you expect? And he's not even a full raccoon dog right now. He's already half Oni on that bottom panel. That's true, yeah. I imagine being that chilly probably makes it hard to hold that vial steady. Yeah, but he's a professional. It'll be fine. Professional, especially when you consider that you see his like little hoof nails are like on top of that vial, right? He's not holding the vial between them. That's true. Yeah. It's like, I guess he's also got very sticky hands. I definitely would have turned into like heavy point or something. So there was more mass to be burned up. And also, so I had real hands. Well, Jordan, you realize, of course, that bets the question. What happens to the ice when he transforms and gets bigger? We're not going to talk about this again. (laughs) Fine. Just note that I want to. Following page here, the Beast Pirate boys are whining, Oh no, why did Queen do this to us? This sucks. They're so strong. We can't get inside that tower to steal the antibodies. The reason they can't is because Drake and Large Man Hyogoro are blocking the entrance. Yeah, and I guess Hyogoro is just not being helped by Marco based off of what he says later. I guess not. I mean, you can kind of see the blue flames on the two dudes on the previous page that they say are, like, helping him out, but I don't see any blue flames on him. His hair is kind of flame-ish, but you can see it's not shaded the same as the, uh, the previous flames. That's also just his hair, I'm pretty sure. Well, yes, but I'm just saying maybe it's midst in there oh, we just okay. can't tell but i don't think that's the case yeah the whole explanation of the virus pulling out the last of his strength is a little weird <laughs> for me i agree but just kind of chalking it up to like all right he's on the verge of death it's like a it's like an adrenaline thing 
<laughs> That's what I'm chalking it up to in my brain, at least. And I'm just going to accept it and move on. Not sure how that literally made him grow, like, eight times as large, but, you know... <laughs> He seems cool with it, and so I am. Yeah, he's got a plan and everything, so... Mm -hmm. His operation is like, hey, I'm going to try and hold him in as long as I can, but if it seems like I'm going to be taking over, probably want to kill me because I'm real strong, so uh, <laughs> take me out before I turn against you, pretty much. And that's the entire rest of this chapter is like building up to a death that does not come <laughs> in this chapter, right, at least. Right, right. But those two statements that he makes kind of contradict each other. Like he says that the virus is burning up the last of his body for fuel. Like he's saying it's the last of it, it's burning it up. But then if it were to get to a hundred percent, he would still be able to fight on. Like, even though it was the virus taking over or whatever, like unless it supersedes that and basically reanimates somebody, I don't see how, those two add up, you know? I agree. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. This guy does seem to think he's going to actually die imminently. But maybe he's just like, at least in his brain, doesn't know how this virus is going to affect him if he's like pretty much dead and infected with it. So maybe he's like better safe than sorry. Sure. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. yeah. I'll buy that. That's my best guess. It would be nice if it were made a little bit more clear, but Hyodoro's no virus expert. <laughs> He's guessing just like you. Yeah, and like you said, he doesn't actually die at the end, so who knows? And that whole not dying at the end thing kind of makes me feel as though he's not actually going to die at all. I agree. Like, why build up to something for half a chapter for it to not happen <laughs> in this chapter? Right. It you would know? feel so weird to open up next week with Hyogoro just like, losing his head. Like, that would be so bizarre. Indeed. It's not usually how One Piece likes to operate. They like to leave. I mean, I guess this is an equally good cliffhanger since he's, like, about to be decapitated in the last page. But usually the big thing happens at the end of the chapter, not at the beginning of it. Right. Very strange. But that's skipping ahead a little bit. We are still back with Hyodoro before he's about to get his head chopped off. He does a weird little move here called the Flaming Hair of Holy Rage. It's supposed to be a sword technique. I don't really see how that's the case. <laughs> Me neither. He, like, sprouts fire out of his back, I guess, that, like, stabs through these guys. Yeah. You can see in the previous panel that he is doing something with his sword, yeah, but it's like wiggling it or something. Yeah, but I can't even fathom how that would translate to what happens in the next one. Maybe he's just moving his sword in such a way that like it's not actually fire stabs. That's just him stabbing with his sword, but it's like an illusion that makes it look like flames because he's moving his sword so fast or could be something like could, that. Could be. I don't I don't know. That's kinda in Brooks territory there. I guess so. But the, and he's a nice man now, so yeah, this, I think that's a fight waiting to happen. <laughs> no, no doubt. Yes. This might be more revealing in the anime a year from now or whatever. I'm hoping. But there were a couple like weird choreography things in this chapter that confused me. We'll get to them later. But for the moment, I guess this is just a power of the flower one sword style. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. Kills these guys. So good for you. He says in the next page, like, he wonders if Odin and he and his prime could have toppled Kaido. So obviously he's something to be feared. Indeed. In the flashback, he was like being hyped up real hardcore. And I think someone in this chapter is like, oh, Kaido tried really hard to recruit him. Mm -hmm. I guess he was pretty buff. Comparable to Odin, perhaps. Huh. I don't know if it actually would have turned the tide against Kaido, but... He's entertaining the possibility, at least. Right. And that says how highly he speaks of himself, if nothing else. But then this whole page is like a death eulogy, <laughs> pretty much. He's like, all right, I've got no regrets and such. And then he doesn't die, Jordan. I know. <laughs> I know. But in this eulogy of his, he calls Luffy his apprentice. It, it feels strange for... Hyogoro to call Luffy his apprentice after 
you know, they, they haven't been working together for all that long or anything. Like, yeah, Luffy saved his life and like he did teach him the new hockey, but to call him an apprentice after that, it feels sort of jumping the gun in my opinion, but maybe I'm just a little hung up on semantics here. I think you just feel that way because the majority of Luffy and Hyodoro's time together was basically off screen. Like what we saw them do was like the day or whatever that they were doing the sumo thing in the jail. But it's been like a two week or whatever training session after that and up until this point. So it's a little bit more time that they were training than what we actually saw, you know? That's true. That's true. We can move on past that. Here's a weird thing, Jordan. Did you know that Queen can shoot fucking lasers? <laughs> it's his beam attack. Of course I knew about it. Of course, his beam attack. That's a thing dinosaurs can do. <laughs> yeah, well, actually oh, they man. can't if a phoenix is around, turns out. That does seem to be the case. Queen attempts to shoot a laser, but uh, he gets hit by a large, clear fireball. <laughs> He's like, whoa, was that a shockwave? Silly Queen. I thought maybe he wondered about the shockwave bit because he's, like, coughing up blood. So for it to have affected him that much, I thought either, like, maybe he's more vulnerable while he's charging up his attack, or maybe it does have some force that kind of subverts hockey or something. I don't know. Well, if you recall, Jordan, uh, what Luffy's been training with all this time is hockey that kind of hits you on the inside. Right. And we know that hockey can be put into projectiles like guns, so maybe this fireball Phoenix brand thing like has advanced armament hockey in it and it hit him on the inside as well as burned his outside. It could. It very well could. It's not said outright anywhere ever, but obviously Marco is up there on the power scale charts. Indeed. So I wouldn't be surprised if he had learned this. We haven't seen anyone use this hockey other than someone from Wano, though, right? We've seen Rayleigh use it, but not in like the same way that Luffy seems to be using it now. We assume that when Roger and Whitebeard were doing their clash, they were using advanced armament hockey then because their attacks weren't actually touching. touching yeah. But aside from like the big boys of the franchise and Luffy now, no, we haven't seen anyone else use it. Okay. I'd be a little surprised if it was just kind of offhandedly an explanation here. But also, I can't see many other reasons why Queen would have been hit so hard, aside from Marco just being that strong, I guess. He's a strong man. But him being a strong man has really ticked off Queen. He shoots another laser. This time he actually gets to shoot it, but alas, Marstro is a fast guy. King takes a swipe. It does connect and cuts off his wing. And this little sequence is what I was most confused about. About yeah. what was actually happening. Yeah, it's very strange. I guess I'm going to try and like walk myself through what I think is happening here. All right. So King slices off the wing. But he's fine because he can like regenerate it. It's just fire or whatever. Marco turns that wing and just dissolves it into feathers. Fire feathers, of course. Lands on a nearby mm-hmm. tower. Then he kind of like molds those feathers that just got sliced off into a big old fireball attack. And that's what's happening on the following page with the bluebird attack. Does that seem to you to be what's happening here? For the most part, the only thing that I thought, maybe taking it just like a half step further, I would imagine that this attack starts out small and then very quickly gets big because I can't think of why else King would have been caught off guard by this, you know? Do you think that where he's like waving his fingers around, he's like swirling it to gain mass? <laughs> Maybe, because like what why else would King, this superior combat being, be caught off guard by an attack that takes what, five panels to charge up? Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. I can't think of any other way other than it either being faster than we're seeing here or for it to grow in size. Because also you see it right by his fingertips, even if that's a perspective thing, it's still fairly small and like kind of drawn out into a spiral, whereas in the next one it is more fireball-esque. True. It doesn't really seem that way 
in any of the panels preceding this. But in the final panel, where he's like actually launched the attack right after the panel where he says Bluebird, it doesn't look like the fireball is being launched very far in that panel. So maybe he's like shooting it kind of point blank, but it looks like there's some distance between them, at least a couple panels prior when he lands on the tower. It's all very strange, I think is the point we're trying to get at. Yeah. Not very clear what's happening here, Oda. No, we know it's cool, but I think we're just missing some reference points, maybe. Mm-hmm. I was reading something the other day, and I don't have a source for this, so forgive me if it turns out to be hooked or something, that uh, Oda's editor or someone close to him said something to the tune of, Oda said that if I was allowed to do 30 pages a week, I would have already like turned in all the pages already because I spend so much time trying to figure out how to condense everything I want to do into just 17 pages each week, you know? Oh, I can totally understand that, yeah. It just got me wishing that for a 30-page a week <laughs> one piece, but I think Oda would literally die if he had to do that every week. He would never be not working. Indeed. Or smoking, for that matter. <laughs> His entire life is one of those two things, I imagine. Yeah, he'd find a way to do them at the same time if he <laughs> was doing 30 pages a week. Indeed. Fortunately for us, the rest of the combat, the next couple pages are fairly straightforward. King has been knocked into a building behind him. Margot goes in for a big old knee attack, which I assume lands. In the meantime, Queen has transformed back into a normal man, has closed the distance, tries to find out what's going on in the rubble, but he gets kicked in the face with a big old bird claw and knocked into that tower that <laughs> he was just on a moment ago. So uh, yeah, Marco is putting in the work, taking care of these two boys at the same time. Oh, yeah, he's handling it quite nicely. Like, on the next page, we do see that he's starting to be out of breath and struggling a little bit. But these are Kaido's top two dudes. So, like, good showing for the white beard pirates Indeed. Here. He's carrying them all on his back, basically. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, but you'll also notice in that same image where he's panting, he's also bleeding a little bit still. So either he just hasn't regenerated that damage yet, or it's not as infinite as we, for his sake... Hoped it might be. I would imagine it's a time thing, but uh, now you've got me scared that it is not. Here's hoping Marco doesn't die in this arc. I can't think of any reason why he would, but I can't imagine he can hold off these two for too much longer. He doesn't seem all that confident in his ability to do so either. Uh, no. Plus, these two that he's fighting are like Zoans. Big, tough guy. <laughs> Zoan types. So they're known for their uh, toughness. They're like ability to tank damage so their stamina might outlast his and Parispero is showing up now so it's a real real awful indeed pass. he already uh, almost had a shot with a big old candy arrow like seven or eight chapters ago so already a bit of an axe to grind there mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and chopper uh might be completely frozen actually <laughs> not very clear he might just be like looking at the the goat man, and that just happens to be the side of his head that is frozen. Right. Yeah, he <laughs> just shocked by something for Indeed. sure. But hurry up, Chopper. People are dying. Marco's having a hard time because of you. Well, not just because of him. It's he. Well, hmm. even if Chopper finishes the antidote, that doesn't really help Marco's situation entirely. I mean, he won't have to worry about allocating his blue flames to the other people but that didn't seem like it was going to be helping them for very much longer anyway. So him finishing the antidote doesn't really seem to really help Marco at all. He still has to deal with these two, or at least somebody has to deal with these two, regardless of the virus situation on the floor. I mean, he might be able to you know, regain some stamina or just some mental capacity from not having to focus on it, but it would be pretty minimal at this point, yeah. Now, if it so happens that uh, Sanji <laughs> comes this way, because it appears that Yamato, Momonosuke, and Shinobu were at least here recently, that might be some of the burden off of his back, and maybe we can get that Queen versus Sanji fight I've been dreaming about for months now, but uh, might just be wishful thinking. 
I could totally see a Marco Yamato Sanji versus Parispero King Queen, not in any particular order, but just like that three on three. I could see that happening. Yeah, I would love that. I mean, we got to get some sort of gag between Yamato and Sanji at some point, I feel like. Absolutely. But that takes us into the final page. Everybody's turning into an ice oni now. Seems Marco's flames could not carry them forever. And uh, Hyodoro is definitely going to die on the first page of the next chapter. Or so they would like us to think. He's definitely, like, what, 90 to 95% oni there? He's not looking good regardless, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. we're definitely in agreement that this whole beheading thing is not going through. It's just a weird situation. If Chopper swoops in on the first page of the next chapter, or whenever we see this conflict again, might not even be next chapter for all we know, and he's like, okay, I have the cure. Hyodoro, you're going to be fine. Why did we spend like three page with Hyodoro reminiscing about his life as though he's going to die? <laughs> right, and if he does die, then why didn't it already happen? It's a little bit anticlimactic because we already saw like the build up to it. Right. The previous chapter. Yeah. So. I guess we'll see when we see. Eh. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. Fortunately, we don't have to wait too much longer for whatever happens next, whether it's this or back to Luffy or whatever, because the next chapter hits March 14th. So we will return next week to discuss it when it comes. Any other parting thoughts about this week's chapter before we pop into the brief news? Nope. Snuck them all in during the, the read through. Good work. Okay, that takes us into the news segment. Not a whole lot this time around. Two quick things I want to bring up. The first thing is that more dub episodes are coming to Funimation. What they call Season 11 Voyage 4, which covers episodes 668 through 681, will be releasing on March 9th, which will probably be the day that this episode goes live. So if you're a dub watcher, surprise, (laughs) new episodes for you to watch right now, maybe. And in addition to that, last week, you, Jordan, mentioned a uh, streaming service thing Mm. that you weren't sure what the details were at the time. And I did put a link to the details in the description, but I did want to address it in brief properly on the show as well. Jordan was talking about there was the first 130 episodes of the One Piece anime, along with the Sits TV specials, or as of last week, now available on the Tubi, T-U-B-I, streaming service with English and Spanish subtitles. So if you have that service and you would like to watch One Piece and haven't already, go ahead and check out that offer. That's all the news I have. I can't imagine you have much to say (laughs) about that. So shall we jump right into the reread? Yeah, we're going to jump into these chunk of chapters. Did about 90 to 100, which is the... Wow, 90 to 100 chapters in one week. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a good week for me. <laughs> yeah, chapters 90 to 100, where Luffy actually fights Arlong, and this whole arc is kind of wrapped up, which was just a delight. One thing that I wanted to point out about Luffy's fight in particular is that I don't know if it's just like a recency thing or if this is actually true, but I don't feel used to seeing Luffy bleed this much. I'm used to seeing him get beat up for sure, but the fact that Arlong uses all sharp edges to fight really made this a wet (laughs) a wet conflict for Luffy. (laughs) You say recency. As far as like the modern day manga, I don't know if Luffy fights very many like slashy boys. Right, Doflamingo. But like, if you mean definitely cut him up, but that's, true. that's kind of the last thing that I can think of. So I just thought that was an interesting uh, obstacle for him to deal with, and he kind of deals with it the same way. Um, we saw him do it with Krieg, where he just kind of like punched through the cape and you know took a few hits on his offense there. Mm-hmm. Just ran through the the line of stakes that were being shot at him. Right, yeah. Luffy really does take a lot of, like, flesh wounds here at the start of his journey. Also, um, this fight, Luffy kind of had to be defensive at a few times, which is interesting. It's not very common for him. We saw both the Gomu shield and the Gomu net, which were 
like strategic defensive moves that he uses. Whereas usually I feel like we get the balloon at the most. Well, if he had used a balloon, he would have poked a big old hole right in his tummy. Well, Jordan. yes, I'm not saying you should use it here. I'm just saying <laughs> that is the only other defensive move that he still kind of pulls out every now and then, you know? I can't believe you're advocating for Luffy to get popped like a balloon. Unbelievable. Yeah, I'd love to see it. It'd be hilarious. He'd blow off into the sea or something. Oh. But yeah, like he doesn't have the power here to do gear second, and he doesn't have armament hockey, so he finds ways to preserve himself that only he can do, and I thought that was real neat. Jordan, did you know there's kind of a debate online about who was actually the stronger between Arlong and Don Krieg? Uh, their bounties are fairly close, so I guess I can understand that. The debate is surprisingly heated from what I've seen. I think most people generally agree that Arlong is the stronger of the two, but uh, the Don Creed beats Arlong party is not small in numbers. It always seemed to me that Arlong was the stronger of the two, but not everybody shares that opinion, which was strange to me when it first popped up on like Reddit or wherever I first read about yeah, it. Yeah, I can't really picture that in my head where that's an actual discussion point because... They, did, they showed their bounties in this chunk here, and they were like either a two or a three million difference, and that was also the same amount of difference between Buggy and Krieg, and I doubt there's a conversation out there about which of them at this point is stronger. True. You do got to keep in mind that while bounties do take power into consideration, they're certainly not like a Dragon Ball Z level direct one-to-one power comparison yeah i know more of a statement on their notoriety than anything right but like if you're even taking into account other things like krieg is he's like going around places and terrorizing all sorts of people whereas arlong is kind of hunkered down and he's got a connection within the navy that's a good point so i yeah i i don't see a world where Arlong isn't stronger than Krieg. Now, Don Krieg does seem to rough Luffy up more in the confrontation that they have compared to what the damaged Arlong manages to do to Luffy. But in the same vein, I'm not sure that the tactics that Don Krieg used to deal that much damage to Luffy would affect Arlong. As you recall, in the Don Krieg fight, Don Krieg was doing everything in his power to use the water to push distance between himself and Luffy, using like the bomb to blind him in the water, like the stakes to prevent him from running across the uh, the plank and all that crap. But none of that would affect Arlon in the slightest because the water is only going to be an advantage for him. So I'm not sure what Don Creed would be able to do to <laughs> yeah. hurt Arlon. I got nothing at all. The point is, if you think Don Creed is stronger than Arlon, you're a dummy and Jordan said so. Uh, yeah, uh, come find me i'll fight you in real life for sure challenge issued challenge denied what else you got about this chunk of chapters uh, i wanted to talk about how arlong is just like kind of delusional <laughs> like he's not ignorant but he is delusional i also wanted to talk about arlong's delusion what a coincidence <laughs> yeah yeah he has convinced himself that he is actually kind of doing Nami a favor, like helping her realize her true potential. And like, he sees himself almost not necessarily as a, a savior, but he, he does, he's convinced himself that he is helping her. Hmm. Like he uses her as a tool, but he sees people at like, that is people's purpose. Well, maybe not people since he's a fisherman, but like that is other beings purposes to him they are just tools for him to use uh, yeah and that's how he has convinced himself that he is like righteous almost and he even says towards the end of the the confrontation like we're gonna treat her relatively right well she'll have all the money and all the clothes she could ever want so what could she possibly complain about right right as though those are the things that nami cares about being basically his slave right exactly so it's just it's bizarre that he can occupy that headspace what what about you what's what's up with your thoughts on delusional arlong so uh arlong's entire east blue conquering plan is just in its very nature the pinnacle of hubris (laughs) 
Yeah, Arlon is pretty strong for this part of the ocean. Maybe stronger than Don Krieg. Apparently it's up for debate. Um, but did this guy really think that the Marines wouldn't send anybody buff if they thought he was going to be a real threat to conquer the entire East Blue? Yeah, he... Seriously? He did not think this all the way through. Like, the Navy could handle him in a heartbeat if they wanted to. If we assume that these cover chapters that are happening with Kobe are happening at roughly the same time as the main story, that means Garp is in the East Blue right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. It's not even that far away. It's only like a few islands south or wherever Shell's town was. Like if Garp wanted to, he's not going to take a bribe. He's going to fuck up Arlon instantly Oh yeah. if he caught wind of this. Yeah, he's a few hours away and it would take mere moments for him to destroy everything Arlon has built up. Like, yeah, the Navy seems to be fairly content just letting Arlon do its thing as long as it's kind of contained on this one island. But I'm reasonably convinced the moment he tries to, like, expand his empire, they're going to put the kibosh on that (laughs) with relative ease. Right. Like, they might be keeping an eye on him to make him, like, one of the seven warlords eventually or something, but anything past that, there's no way they would allow. Indeed. Point is, Arlon, maybe next time you've got a bid strategy, think it through with a little bit more brain. Let's hope it never comes to that. (laughs) Hopefully. The next bit that I wanted to touch on was talking about Luffy's first wanted poster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's kind of just now occurring to me how, basically how perfect that first wanted poster is, because the Navy... Like the picture, you mean? Oh, yeah. Because the Navy doesn't know next to anything about this kid, right? They've gotten reports, and I think in the initial report, they did not actually relay the information of Monkey D. Luffy. So, like, they they find it out eventually, but in the initial thing, I don't think they knew yet. But they're being told that he's an upstart from the East Blue, and they get this picture of him, and he's got this big shit-eating grin on his face. And you know some of the higher-ups just looked at that, and they were like, fuck (laughs) like oh no it's happening again uh yeah that's that's probably true i mean i'm sure some of the older marines that are still chilling on the east blue probably got some roger vibes right off the bat i assume of course we're talking about those vibes from the back of usopp's head in the uh oh yeah in the water yeah that's the most intimidating part of the whole thing just want to make sure we were on the same page about mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. But uh, even the number they say is like unprecedented. Oh yeah, a starting bounty of thirty million. It is that is ten times higher than the average of East Blue for his first mm-hmm. bounty. That's insane. Now they may have just been saying that, like in reference to the East Blue, they like maybe it's unprecedented for the East Blue, but they don't say that. So you could also get the implication that they mean worldwide, unprecedented having a bounty that high either way i think it is impressive he's already jumped above the the three people that he's knocked out he doubled buggies on his first try so poor buggy yeah yeah i miss that guy he's not gonna be happy to hear about that no no i think we actually (laughs) see some of that rage later quite that much later bit of an ass to grind that guy (laughs) no doubt about that And he almost gets a chance to. But before that, I know that previously we had, well, I feel like we had talked about um, sort of Mihawk's title as Strongest Swordsman. And I believe you might have brought up Shanks as sort of a contender for that title. But in this chunk of chapters, we do see Mihawk call Shanks a one-armed has-been, even when Shanks is... He has just said that he's in a bad mood. So, like, they obviously either have some sort of past connection where they're, like, kind of friends and they can joke around, or Mihawk is that confident that he is a better swordsman than Shanks. I think it's a little of both. But Mihawk's title as the strongest swordsman in the world has always been a little bit weird, if you think about it. Like, Like you said, presumably based off this confrontation when Shanks had two arms he and Mihawk were kind of rivals but presumably 
that was before he became a uh, an emperor because I think it said that like it was only like four years ago that he became an emperor when we recently saw his bounty for the first time and he lost his arm seven years ago I believe so presumably he must have become a buffer guy to obtain this new larger title and now Mihawk is like nah I don't want to fight you but you also consider that Big Mom kind of a swordsman is Mihawk stronger than Big Mom mm-hmm. Mihawk bit of a tenuous hold on that title of his but uh we'll see how he feels hopefully relatively soon when uh Zoro gets around to uh trying to take that title from him again yeah it's gonna be a heck of a clash when that does happen I also was again I don't know if this is just because I haven't reread things in a while or because uh when it's on a weekly release I don't notice these things but I found myself really missing the early days where like in between islands they would have this downtime where they could kind of just do things like seeing Nami do the clothes shopping and Zoro buying a sword that was all really nice to see I personally could watch Usopp shop like a housewife for (laughs) quite some time him seeing those eggs and just being like oh are these on sale was it's such a minor thing but it had me rolling over with laughter Poor Usopp, though. It's one per customer uh, deal on those eggs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a real shame. <laughs> Can't stop up. <laughs> uh, and then he had to carry the heavy end of the fish. Gosh. Yeah, it's rough. The Nami going on a shopping spree moment particularly stood out to me because that's probably, but the reason she's probably like spending all that money right now is because she's never really had any money to spend mm-hmm. just for herself, right? All of her cash. Yeah, everything that she had got. Going right to the, the fund to buy back her village. So probably a very liberating experience for her oh yeah yeah and then also to just have the power to be like no nah, i'm gonna go get something else uh fits her <laughs> character perfectly indeed i feel a little bit bad for that employee she was kind of heckling but you know she's lovable so i'll forgive her yeah yeah putting those away is gonna <laughs> suck but what can indeed. you do now uh the name are you familiar with like the the road town load town translation thing jordan mostly yeah unless you're about to drop some hidden knowledge bit on me well i don't know how hidden the knowledge is but in the original version the japanese and in the subtitle version of the anime and all that the name of this town they're in is load town Mm -hmm. l-o-g-u-e town right because it's meant to be like prologue and epilogue right since it's the town of the beginning and the end it's where Gold Roger with those born, and he died there. So the fact that Viz decides to call it Road Town probably bothers me more than like the Zoro Zolo thing, because you know there's not like a hidden meaning behind like Zoro, <laughs> right? Just right. The, the guy's name. It's annoying that they got it wrong, but yeah, it doesn't like take away from the meaning of things, right? As opposed to this Load Town's meaning, cool as heck. Road Town is nonsense. Just a bit of a sore spot for me. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, I'm with you. Absolutely. Because the first time that I would have read this, it definitely would have been Logue Town. And like that that stood out because you you got to find those hidden meanings. They're everywhere. And they're just, it's not that they further the story or anything, but they certainly make it more memorable, more, more worthy of praise. It's like flavor text. Fleshes out the world a little bit more. Exactly. And that's what Oda's known for. Well, yeah, and it's a heck of a world to flesh out, so kudos <laughs> to him. And then in this Logue town, quite a bit happens. The main thing, though, uh, that we have to discuss is the whole dragon possible wind powers thing. Because going into this chunk of chapters with that in mind, the evidence is it's all right there. It all makes so much sense that Dragon would have some control over weather in some way. It seems almost confirmed that he at least has wind powers. Because he has an attack here that is wind blast. Exactly. So And like the the whatever the pressure dropping and temperature change or whatever that Nami noticed, like that came out of nowhere. So 
yeah, this this seems to be something, and gosh, that would be such a helpful power for someone like him. So it just it makes too much sense for me to not sign on to that right now, you know. Yeah, it does seem a little bit suspicious. It's all very coincidental <laughs> if like fate was conspiring for Luffy to be able to get away, which is also, you know, kind of cool in its own right, but it's very Oda to like kind of add in something in this case, the appearance of Dragon to later explain like how he actually managed mm-hmm. to get away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so barring it being Enel or something like <laughs> it it just yeah. I, I think this is another Oda ism. Now whether or not it's literal weather control like we were speculating a few weeks ago, or just like air powers and he's like adjusting air pressure and thus that's how he's making all these weather phenomena happening. Who can say? Maybe we'll know one day, but for now at least something air related. <laughs> right. Judging from the name of the attack. And very powerful regardless. So Indeed. Yeah, I wouldn't mess with him. But that is all I had for this chunk. We're just starting out on the journey to the Grand Line, so I've got a lot to look forward to in the next chunk. Is there anything that you wanted to touch on? Nope, I pretty much covered all of my points as we were going. Nice. So that about wraps us up. No break next week, like I said before. So when the chapter releases on March 14th, uh, we'll go ahead and do another episode. That'll be chapter 1007 and the next chunk of reread chapters. So uh, until then, we'll talk to you guys next time. Yep. Thanks for listening, everyone.